If there's one thing that we've learned from BoJack Horseman is that there is more to life than just being rich and famous. Our favorite characters display many admirable qualities, dedication, compassion, and very rarely, intelligence. But just who is the smartest in Hollywood? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and today we'll be ranking the cast of BoJack Horseman from dumbest to most brilliant. Alright, a few rules before we get started. We'll be looking at book smarts, emotional intelligence, success, and overall capabilities. This covers all kinds of brilliance. When looking at a character's dumb mistakes, we'll be looking at the mistake and why they made it. Wouldn't it be weird if literally nobody saw your movie? Self-destructive tendencies that stem from diseases or conditions won't be considered as dumb, as poor decisions may due to other factors. But with that said, let's hop into it. First, we have our dumbest darlings. While some of our most lovable characters fall into this category, we love them for qualities other than their high intellect. First is Pickles. If you ever have trouble remembering Pickles' name, you'll be in a pickle. Then you just have to remember her name is the thing you're in, but with an S. It's the smartest trick from our dumbest character, but don't get us wrong, we love her. She's a good dog who doesn't have the brains to match that beautiful heart. She has the genius idea to lie on her resume to get a job. After being fired as a systems analyst and as an air traffic controller the second time, she stumbles into the more sensible job as a waitress. And she's not great at that either. She doesn't take down orders, can't remember them, and suggests embarrassing off-menu items. Is chicken salad a celebrity? She's seemingly rescued from waiting tables by her new boyfriend, Mr. Peanut Butter. Unfortunately, her naivety and inexperience with relationships mean that her love life doesn't go any better than her professional ventures. We blame a lot of that on Mr. Peanut Butter, who is older and should know better. But to wrap it up, let's just say she may mature when she gets to be an older dog. It's just never something we get to see. Following her is the Gwyn family. The Gwyns are making it to the list together, all except for Diane. And yes, this includes Gary, the black sheep of the family. Aside from the fact that they don't get much screen time, they all collectively represent the same thing, Diane's humble and angry roots. This is a family that can't stand spoilers for the pre-taped 88 championship that they've watched the recording of over 100 times. It harbors the sons who didn't realize their dad was dead until after they'd had a party drawing inappropriate images on his face. That was before we knew he was dead. We just thought he was wicked hungover. It didn't take more than one appearance for us to conclude that Diane was the only one with brains in the family. Next is Vincent Adultman. Vincent Adultman is a recurring character and former partner of Princess Caroline. He's also the only character who makes a fool of everyone he comes into contact with, since they all fail to notice that he is just three children in a trench coat. Bojack points this out multiple times, only to be ignored and cast away as jealous. As for what puts him this low in our scale, we refer you to his last name, Adultman. There's also the fact that he works at a business factory. I went to the stock market today. I did a business. His design includes one arm that is a broomstick. He likes to unwind by watching R-rated movies and going to bars. It's impressive that three kids can pull off a scheme for as long as they want. Still, many, many mistakes were made along the way. Following him is Sextina Aquafina. The teenage pop star and dolphin, Sextina Aquafina, is a great example of most of Princess Caroline's more careless clients. She's first introduced when she's doing an interview about former child star Sarah Lynn. She comments how Sarah Lynn was an inspiration to her and her music, but now she's old and no one cares about her anymore. While Sextina is comically unaware that she's on the same path, bound to someday be forgotten by the masses. There's also the incident where Diane accidentally sends out through her social media that she's getting an abortion. Sextina is obviously furious until she realizes how much positive attention she will get for being the face of the pro-choice movement. She resists being educated about the actual issues during the ruse and makes more than one off-color comment. Brat, brat, pew, pew. This is show business. Brat, brat, pew, pew. We move on to the lovable Todd Chavez. You may be surprised that Todd made it even this far on the list. This is the man that accidentally loses his hard-earned millions by over-tipping his waitress. Well, guess I'm broke again. The man has been in not only one, but two prison gangs. He also joined an improv cult aboard something called the Giggle Ship. He gets into a lot of trouble and struggles with even basic things because of his lack of smarts. But Todd does actually learn things about both life and himself. We think he has some of the most personal growth out of any one character, and that's something. We don't want to confuse his naivete for a total lack of intelligence. 
we move next to the blackmailing birds. These characters make an early appearance where they have an arc over a few episodes in the first season. They attempt to blackmail Bojack, only to find out that he's not so easy to get a hold of once they've taken the incriminating photos. It would be a shame if these pictures got out. However, what really secures their spot on the list is that they only wanted $150 each. It probably wasn't enough to cover the price of the cameras they were using, let alone risk four years in prison for the illegal blackmailing they were doing. Up next, we have the news. We want to start by looking at the news anchor for MSNBC and the witty banter with this co-host, Randy. I clearly said it, Randy, don't look at Jessica. This is on you. Usually the little jabs are shallow, but it results later in a surprising understanding between the two. But our point extends past the two of them and to virtually all the newscasters of Hollywood. Who doesn't love a Ryan Seacrest type, even when that's literally his name? Later, he's joined by his co-host, some lady, then by an actress or something. We think that the media depiction, in general, depicts the rather vapid nature of the celebrity scene. And who better to portray this point than this selection of easy caricatures that appear on the network? Moving forward, we have the Witherspoons. Most of our complaints are about Charlie Witherspoon, but it will become later in a moment why we group them together. John Witherspoon is a man who climbed up the industry ladder to eventually run his own agency. He is successful as a businessman and an agent, even though he ignores the concerns and achievements of his employees. When he has a stroke and is forced to step down, he leaves all his years of hard work not to the capable team he's established, but in the very sticky hands of his son, Charlie. Being a boss is really hard. Charlie wasn't even fit to be an intern, let alone run a company. He also never seems to improve anything but his wardrobe. Following them is Stuart and Tracy. Stuart and Tracy are the long-lost twins that find each other, only to lose each other again. It was one of the nearest misses in the show's run, but even before that, neither one of them could be deemed intelligent. Stuart is Princess Caroline's assistant and not good at it. Someone named Bojark Hoosman is here. Tracy is Princess Caroline's adoption agent, and well, you see where this is going. Next is Stephanie. Stephanie shares a lot in common with our smartest characters. She's a bright young career woman who eventually sells her startup company, Girl Crush, to a multi-billion dollar corporation. All sounds good, right? But unlike our other go-getters, Stephanie comes from money. This doesn't make her stupid, but Girl Crush probably loses more money than it generates. She hires journalists with integrity to make her content more interesting and incentivizes them to write more clickbait. Often, they're forced to write this clickbait from a yoga ball or treadmill or whatever trendy news desk they have in that week. The real kicker comes in when she actually sells the company, essentially a hobby to her at this point, because she forgets that she's rich. I'm gonna be rich. You already are rich. Oh, yeah. Finally, we get around to Mr. Peanut Butter. He's a good dog. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. But is he smart? No. Like Todd before, Mr. Peanut Butter has emotional honesty and growth throughout the show. He's able to communicate when something is wrong, a rare quality in this environment. His relationship with Diane is a perfect example of how he can learn and grow as a character. His relationship with Pickles is an example of what he still has to overcome. He tries to rush into getting serious with her because he's insecure and terrified of his identity outside of a relationship. But let's talk about some of the other Mr. Peanut Butter classic hits. He lucks into every job that he gets, ignoring many intelligent fiscal choices along the way. He opens up his own company, PB Living, which just hemorrhages money on ideas that he doesn't follow through. He bankrolls all of Todd's worst ideas, including the Halloween store that's only open in January, and smoothies, a mood you can drink. It's a smoothie, a mood that you drink. He fills his house with strainers and then can't remember why. But as our favorite dog once said, every idea sounds stupid if you describe what it is. This series of poorly conceived misadventures is one of the main reasons we love the character. Still, it also shows the utter lack of foresight that keeps him from being smart. Next is Henrietta. She is, without a doubt, one of the most gullible characters on the list. She likes paintings because they're like still TV, and books because she sees them as painting with words. She's a simple girl who lets herself get manipulated first by Butterscotch Horseman, then by his wife. This goes so far that she ends up putting her own baby for adoption against her will. Next is poor Mr. Pinky Penguin. 
The publishing industry he works in is having a rough time, and the economy in Hollywood is not great. What gets him on the list is not the financial troubles, but how the company arrives at them. They spend millions on marketing and merch for franchises no one has ever heard of. They pay unreasonable advances to celebrities with no book writing experience. We want to give him the benefit of the doubt and blame the industry, but his stint in broadcast television goes just as poorly. Behind him is Oxnard. He struggles with a stressful job and fails to set boundaries with his boss. However, his career failures have little to do with him and more to do with his whimsical yet idiotic client, Mr. Peanut Butter. This company is more in the red than Carrie on prom night. We blame him mostly for continuing to work for him after the pasta strainer incident. Now let's talk about Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Sugarman. We're putting these two together since they both reflect the attitude of the times and serve to illustrate Beatrice's poor upbringing. You can sprinkle some sugar on a lemon. That's a good healthy girl snack. Unfortunately for them, the times they represent were sexist and less than brilliant. They believed in very harmful stereotypes about what a woman should be. This culminated in Mrs. Sugarman receiving a lobotomy to cure her of her grief. She doesn't grow or heal after that for obvious reasons, but it seems like her husband didn't take anything away from it either. On a lighter note, let's talk about Hollywood celebrities. What do they know? Do they know things? Well, we never really get to find out. At least not in most cases. Since the show covers the lives of celebrities in the city, some characters technically fall into this category, and you'll see them getting their own entries here. You've already seen Mr. Peanut Butter, and he's one of Hollywood's biggest celebrities. He is, after all, the host of HCW DTK DTK TLFO. This entry is meant to encompass the rotation of famous characters. We're ranking them together not because we think they share the exact level of intelligence, but because they all represent the same thing. They collectively stand in for the self-centered and often vapid figures that never cease to be thrust onto pedestals by the public, and we're ranking them in the bottom tier because generally they're not depicted as the most intelligent. We just like to toss in a disclaimer because we're sure that the very real celebrities that some of these characters are based on are, in fact, brilliant. Daniel Radcliffe makes an enemy of his co-star right before going on to a competitive game show. J.D. Salinger attempts to hide where he runs a tandem bicycle shop with the motto about loneliness being preferable. Andrew Garfield gets put into a full-body cast falling through the floor of a Halloween and January store. Jessica Biel can't stop making puns about her own name. I now pronounce this marriage over. Beal with it! Zach Braff dies in a fire-worshipping cult during a benefit gone wrong. Even Naomi Watts, who gets portrayed favorably in comparison to others, wants something easy and less challenging in her professional life. That's her arc. And those are just the celebrities who have their actual names used. It doesn't even count Jerk Clooners or Lerner de Capricorn or Mitt Derman or Bred Poot. There's a character named Quentin Tarantolino who goes from director of a blockbuster film to the curator of a bi-monthly snack box. Okay, we know that's confusing, but it's the bi-monthly that means every other month. We can't name all of them, but we can appreciate what they all bring to the table, even if these celebrities are not so bright. Next, we have our average. No alliteration here, just the characters with the run-of-the-mill smarts. First is Cracker Jack. Cracker Jack was Beatrice's older brother, and he left a big impression. His absence was almost more of a character than he was. His loss destroys a generation of the Sugarman family and sours his sister's upbringing, as well as Bojack's. He was a soldier, a musician, and a beloved son and brother. He has the sparks of talent and charm that saved him from being in the bottom section. However, it's largely speculation, as his appearances are fleeting and or imagined. Next is Copernicus. He runs an improv group that is definitely not about Scientology. While it is impressive that he has his own cult and cruise line, we are less impressed by other aspects of his character. He has to research his butt jokes to appear funny. He's not very good at scheming. Worst of all is how he teaches, or rather, fails to teach his improv students. They all seem to believe that if you die in improv, you die in real life. We wonder where they got that idea from. Next is Rutabaga Rabidowitz. He's smart, in some ways. He's a husband, a father, and a successful agent. He's one of the rare characters that can find a healthy balance between his work and personal lives. But he also talks Princess Caroline, his mistress at the time, into starting her own agency. He puts all the company in her name so his wife can't get it in the divorce. He burns all his bridges to his old job on his way out, and then lets Princess Caroline know that he plans to keep his wife. We don't blame her for breaking up with him and firing him from the company he left in her name. My name is on all the paperwork. I think I can do it without you. Next is Sharana. 
She got her sober co-worker and starred the sitcom she worked for, Hooked on Vodka. They were careful enough to hide the vodka in water bottles, but not careful enough to keep it away from children. Though Sarah Lynn's drinking was Bojack's fault, Sharana enabled him and pushed him to the point where this tragedy happened. Speaking of tragedies, we move now to Hank Hippopopoulos. Hank Hippopopoulos threatened Diane for writing a takedown of him. While it didn't come back to bite him, that has more to do with the status than his smarts. He didn't hide his sleazy actions or his threats very well. Next, we have Irving, the daughter of Kelsey Janning. It's possible that Irving does grow up to be the youngest Supreme Court justice. It's also possible that she does something in marketing, which is her well-thought-out backup career. But what we're gonna remember is the condescending attitude of a teenager. Next is Sarah Lynn. Bear with us because we're about to get into some dark waters for a moment. A lot of Sarah Lynn's biggest mistakes don't stem from stupidity, so much as substance abuse issues. Yeah, she makes poor decisions, but she was led to those decisions by her trauma, lifestyle, and afflictions. The tragedy of Sarah Lynn is that she is intelligent. She wants to be an architect, a girlhood dream crushed by her time in the spotlight. She has a natural aptitude for it and a penchant for deep insights, even under the influence. Sarah Lynn could have been higher on this list if the show had her in more opportunities to show off that side of herself. Getting a drug named after you is cooler than getting an Oscar. The episode where she actually gets to share these aspects of her personality is, unfortunately, the episode she dies. That's too much, man. Next is the man who made her famous, Herb Kazaz. He was an intelligent man. He did well for himself. He found success in a competitive field before moving on to philanthropy. Occasionally, there was even some tiny insight into who the man was. It was enough to leave us with the impression of a smart individual, but we don't feel like we can rank him too high. This is, after all, a man who tweeted out a narration of a car accident while it was happening instead of preventing it. Next, we have Vanessa Gecko. Gecko is a career-oriented mother who's trying to have it all. She's annoyingly successful and never lets anyone forget it. If you need me, I'll be at work. Bye! Her role in the series seems to be going toe to paw with Princess Caroline, and sometimes she even wins. She also misses obvious signals that are right in front of her, such as how she's perceived in the office. She's surprised and wounded to find out that Princess Caroline has viewed her as an enemy after years of passive-aggressive fighting that Gecko initiates. Following her is Wayne. We have a lot of complaints about Wayne in regards to his character. He's annoying and pretentious and has poor timing. There's little denying his brain, however. He works for BuzzFeed. Have you just been mashing keys this whole time? Although he doesn't have the most prestigious writing job, it also means that he's holding down a job based on creative merit. While some of his articles are obvious attempts at clickbait, he does offer valid and deep criticism at multiple points. He writes both on the topics which he's writing about and on the industry that publishes them. Now we move to Corduroy Jackson Jackson. We have a lot of respect for Corduroy. Like so many other struggling characters, he tries to destroy the habit that he believes will lead to his downfall. He turns to religion, so that he has something else to take that place in his life. He's a talented actor and a straightforward, honest man. It's a real shame that it only took him relapsing once to kill him, but not everyone gets multiple chances to change. And some don't change at all, like Beatrice and Butterscotch Horseman. Their match was probably the worst decision either of them ever made. As such, we thought they should appear together. Butterscotch Horseman was what you would call a wild horse, though he had lofty artistic pursuits that gave him depth. He was going to write the all-American novel. The points he wanted to include were well thought out, though he lacked the talent to give them life. Beatrice Horseman, the heiress to the Sugarman Sugar Fortune, had more than her fair share of wit as well. She graduated college before getting pregnant with her son and marrying the man who had fathered him. It led to a life of bitterness, something which Beatrice was unafraid to allude to. You ruined me, Bojack. I know. She may well be the smarter of the pair, but she contributed just as much to their unhappy environment. And now, Emily. She has wacky ideas and trouble following a train of thought. She pays developers to make an app so she can date firemen. Or more specifically, they can date red-headed women named Emily. We think there may have been an easier way to find a fireman, but she seems happy, well-balanced, and she occasionally has very good ideas. She's also good at seeing and supporting the best ideas in other people, such as Todd. After her, we have Charlotte and the kids. Charlotte is the character we know best. As a family, they all seem pretty normal until they invite Bojack to live with them. From kissing Bojack, to trying to kiss Bojack, to not recognizing Bojack's voice as a cable company survey man, they all made mistakes once the horse moved in. 
Next is Officer Meow Meow Fuzzy Face. Whether the renegade cop who plays by his own rules or the loose cannon, Fuzzy Face gets results. No, seriously, he does. It's one of the only reasons he's not lower on this list. However, he can be slow in the uptake. This speaks largely to the sitcom charm, and we can't penalize him too harshly since eventually he catches on. That's more we can say for many of the other characters. We move to Mr. Cuddly Whiskers. We don't blame him alone for the failures of the BoJack Horseman show. We almost entirely blame that on BoJack. But he had the rare gift of a completely greenlit show that was unanimously loved by the network and gave it all up just to be more offensive. It could easily have ruined his and BoJack's career. Next is Gina Casador. We like to think that Gina is smart. She's made it as an actress when she's first introduced, but it isn't until Filbert that she finds mainstream success. She makes the reasonable but soul-crushing decision to cover for BoJack after he chokes her on set. She doesn't want to be remembered for him and the trauma he caused her. It shows that she understands her own limits and the inner workings of the dark industry that she works in. Next, we have Lenny Turtletop. His self-confidence, track record, and success in the industry speak for themselves. Sometimes he does make the wrong call or will need to be persuaded into something. However, generally speaking, he has good instincts, lots of experience, and knows when something will be more trouble than it's worth. And rounding out the tier is Bo Jack Horseman. We need to once again draw the line between stupid and self-destructive. Looking back to Bojack's sort of upbringing, coupled with his predisposition for depression, anxiety, and alcoholism, it's a wonder that he's functional. The entire show was built around the premise that Bojack makes a series of self-destructive decisions that will hurt himself and the people he cares about. But with many of these decisions, it becomes apparent that he's not stupid, but actually struggling. There are so many little instances of Bojack's intelligence that could be brought up. A lot of his brightest, wittiest moments appear through small jabs and offhand comments. Sometimes he mentions references that show there's a lot more going on under the surface. You are somehow even more stupid than the sum of your stupids. He's aware of his own worst tendencies, is surprisingly well-educated, and has deep insights into the things he cares about. On those rare occasions where he chooses to help others and share information, it's something he could be really good at. Of course, he doesn't do those things often. While we don't blame him entirely for his drug dependency, depression, or narcissism, we blame him a little for constantly choosing environments that will exacerbate those underlying issues. That, along with the history of poor decision-making, is what keeps him from being in the top tier. And finally, we have our beautiful, our brilliant, our best in show in the IQ department. These are the characters with the street smarts, book smarts, and very rarely, the emotional intelligence to truly shine. Kicking off this section, we have Angela. Angela is somewhat of an evil mastermind or close enough to be one. After all, she is a TV exec. She convinces Bojack to betray his best friend in the 90s so that they don't lose money. And every day we don't fire him, we're flushing money down the crap. In the 2010s, she's only gotten more powerful. She manipulates Bojack into signing away profits for horsing around. She does it so smoothly that it doesn't even matter if she shows her hand. Next is Sebastian St. Clair. He is a smart narcissist. He's a philanthropist who clearly only cares about helping people to look good in the process. He certainly did. <gasps> See, Diane, I told you not to make friends. He makes a lot of mistakes that could prove a detriment to his image. For instance, he has a picture painted of himself posing for the statue of him building a library in war-torn Cadorvia. But he does something smart in choosing Diane to write his book. The fact that he seeks out someone he knows can make a narcissist like Bojack look good suggests that he's not as unaware as he seems about how some of his actions look outside. Following him is Hollyhock Mannheim Mannheim Guerrero Robinson Zibler Schlag sung Fonzarelli McQuack. She's young and troubled. Obviously, she's going to have many things to work through, especially since she's predisposed to a lot of the same issues as her brother Bojack. Despite her anxiety and laziness, she's a bright young student. She graduated high school early, gets into a good college, and knows when her brother is a bad influence on her. We move on to Margot Martindale. Character actress Margot Martindale is depicted as a mad genius. She has the same poor decision-making skills that make everyone entertaining, but her execution is always excellent. She agrees to follow Bojack into an enthusiastic life of crime, in which she is constantly raising the stakes. While she's in hiding, she goes on a national television show and stars in multiple plays. But she can come up with several good schemes of her own and evade the law many times in creative ways. Not to mention how talented she is in the world of Hollywood. Oh, if only I wasn't so good at acting. Next is Ralph Stilton. 
Like his sister Stephanie, Ralph works in his own industry despite being rich enough that he never has to. He makes cards to rival Hallmark, and some of them, such as Birthday Dad, go on to be a huge hit. We think Ralph is a good candidate for this tier because he's aware of what makes him happy. He's successful at his job, but he doesn't let that interfere in his personal life, except when Princess Caroline insists that it should. He knows when his partner has overworked herself and can recognize her boundaries with him. Although he doesn't end up with PC, he's probably one of the only people on this list that gets much of a happily ever after. We believe he'd be the only one to recognize it. Before we forget, let's talk about Doctor Who. That's Dr. H.U., not Dr. Who from the very popular BBC series Doctor Who that only Bojack remembers. He gets credit for making it through medical school to become a doctor. While the drug dealer lifestyle that he adopts after earning his degree is not something we approve of, it's also not something that we think is done entirely out of stupidity. We don't know Doctor Who's story, except for the part where he regenerates to become a new doctor. We can't say that leads him into the shady way of wheeling and dealing prescription pills, but we also think he gets a tremendous amount of credit for finally getting clean and turning Bojack away. If the show has taught us anything, it's that Doctor Who's time walking the straight path will probably deviate before the end of his life, but he seems to be doing well, and we hope that he sticks to it. Next is Anna Spanakopita. A lot of our highest ranking characters are either evil masterminds or highly driven career persons. Anna Spanakopita is a little of both. Her ambition drives her forward into becoming a very successful publicist. She does her best work leading up to Oscar season. When people see you, they need to think, Oscar winner! Of course, this is also because she represents multiple people each season. It's not a terrible fallback, though it pits her clients against one another and it's a little disingenuous. She gets the credit and doesn't care who wins or loses. That's where we get to see the smart but scheming side of her. She's also insightful. She will share deep, personal stories with poignant points to illustrate things that may be painful in her present. A good example of this is a story she tells Bojack of the time she spent as a lifeguard, with the takeaway, not all drowning people want to be saved. Following her is Yolanda. Yolanda is a practical, career-driven young woman. She's good at her job and takes a no-nonsense approach to her evaluations that carry over into her personal life. While that leads to problems with her and Todd, it also isn't a bad quality. She knows what she wants, and she expects the best not only from herself, but from those she cares about. We move on to Kelsey Janning. Kelsey Janning is the indie darling of the director world, or at least she is when the show starts. She struggles with her career at numerous points. People hire her because they want to see her powerful work shine through in their projects. What a cute, funny face. You want a cookie? Uh, Can someone okay. get this guy a cookie? Just as often, they fire her or make her redo work because it's too challenging. Kelsey knows when to throw in the towel and do Chicken for Days promo pieces to send her daughter to school. She also knows when to speak up for herself and take risk. She eventually does with Fire Flame, getting her back in the public eye for the first time since being fired from Secretariat. This belief and her vision allows her to find commercial success, and there are very few characters who deserve it more. Next is Katrina. Katrina is one of Mr. Peanut Butter's ex-wives and a powerful political figure. Her goal is to get someone elected that she can control to do the bidding of the companies she lobbies for. Again, the evil scheming archetype. What we think ranks her particularly high is that she always sees the opportunity in everything. When the governor of California says that he won't ski race Mr. Peanut Butter for the governorship because it would be unconstitutional, Katrina sees that as a yes. She gets that amendment into the Constitution by sneaking in policies for the people she needs to fund and condone it. She's a terrible person, but there's little denying that she is impressive. Amanda Hannity is next. She's the manatee working at Manatee Fair. We don't know much about her other than she has a keen eye for what she does. No, yes, turtleneck. You're fired. She's worked her way up to a position of power and doesn't intend to lose it. She backs down on certain stories that she thinks are going to get her into hot water. For instance, with the Hank Hippopolis story, she kills it when she realizes that it's going to be a conflict of interest with the major conglomerate that just bought out her magazine. It was painted as a cowardly decision. However, for her and the employees under her, she probably made the right call. Next, we have Guy. Guy is a successful freelance cameraman. He works for himself doing something that he loves and seems to be great at it. He's also aware of the needs of others. When Diane is suffering through her depression, he knows when to encourage her, push her, and when he needs to back off and let her work through things independently. You're the most beautiful person in the world to me. Based on his comments about his previous marriage, this is how we think he 
always is in relationships. He's not some kind of genius about everything, but he's well-rounded, intelligent, and has made it to a point he can enjoy his life. There's something smart about that. Not to mention he avoids many big mistakes that the other cast falls into constantly. Following him is his enemy, Jeremiah White Whale. He is the epitome of evil geniuses. His company, White Whale, buys out Philip Morris, Disney, Fox, AT&T, AOL, Time Warner, PepsiCo, Viacom, Halliburton, Skynet, Toyota, Trader Joe's. That makes him responsible for just about every company in the country, leaving him few competitors. Once it becomes legal for companies to murder people, he knows that he's untouchable. A sad commentary about the dystopian future of capitalism? Yeah, but it unquestionably makes White Whale an evil genius. Following him is his other adversary and member of the main cast, Diane Gwynn. Here, on the complete opposite spectrum as the rest of her family, we have Diane. She is a constant character from the pilot episode onward, and this is no small part due to how smart she is. That's not to say that she doesn't have any room to grow throughout the series, because she does. It takes the course of the series for her to learn how to balance her moral beliefs with self-enjoyment. It's good to see her grow, but it's also nice whenever we're reminded that Diane thinks for herself. She doesn't let the Hollywood media tell her who or what she should be interested in. This is something that makes her a compassionate person. However, for a long while, she wrecks her personal life. Her negativity can be toxic, but it's also her recognizing parts of the world that she feels are unjust and trying to reconcile her own happiness as part of that environment. Next is Mr. Jorge Chavez. Jorge is Todd's stepfather and the reason why his last name is Chavez. Jorge is proud that he shared his last name with Todd, but often disappointed in what Todd has done with it. The two couldn't be less alike. Jorge is calm, collected, and cautious. Todd follows every whim and trusts that things are going to work out. The two of them make a really good team in the episode where Todd ropes Jorge into stealing his kidney back from the corporation that bought it. Todd takes a press pass and can't remember his own fake name, but Jorge is able to get in through the front door while smuggling him in. It shows that he's quick on his feet. Despite how often he preaches about plans, caution, and the traditional life path that he wanted for his son. Up next is Woodchuck Kudchuck Berkowitz. Who could forget Woodchuck Kudchuck Berkowitz? He's the rightful and appropriate governor of California. Though he's nagged into risking the position in a ski race with Mr. Peanut Butter that causes a spin-off election and nearly unseats him, he is a democratically elected governor. He's good at his job. People actually like Berkowitz. Until so Katrina decides that he needs to be replaced with someone easier to control. He comes up with fair policies that put the people first. He works to achieve things like drought relief. He even goes underground to rescue the people at a Mr. Peanut Butter benefit, even though they're all running against him. He's a selfless, sensible man who wants to do the best for a state, and more often than not, he's very good at it. Moving on, we have Judah. Judah takes everything very literally, and has a tough time reading social cues or understanding those around him. This is something that even he brings up from time to time. One of the most notable examples of this self-referencing is in the love song that he writes for Princess Caroline. I strive for precision, my aim is to be accurate and clear. Despite his struggles with interpersonal communications, Judah is efficient and intelligent. He knows what Princess Caroline needs of him and follows her instructions. I was joking. I'm sorry, I sometimes have trouble reading tone. He also knows how to look out for himself, which is an important quality. When Vim was struggling and he was picking up extra work, he proposed taking a stake in the company rather than a raise to reflect the extra work he was doing. It was more viable for the company, but also elevated him higher in its ranks. This was, in one brilliant stroke, a selfish and selfless deed. It's that sort of efficiency that makes us, and especially Princess Caroline, appreciate her assistant and eventual husband, Judah. And the most brilliant character goes to Princess Caroline. She has her blind spots, though. We would refer you again to the Vincent Adultman entry on this list. There is also the recurring mistake of falling for Bojack, whom she knows is too emotionally stunted to return her affection in the way that she needs. But we want to look at her professional life as an example of why she is an excellent and intelligent character. Princess Caroline comes from nothing. She had 11 siblings. They weren't well off, and she felt responsible for her mother growing up. She goes from that position of poverty to the owner of her own agency, and eventually to her dream job as a manager. The way she can solve problems, think on her feet, and create opportunities almost out of thin air is something to behold. And yes, she is stubborn when it comes to her love life. It takes her a long time to find Judah. What shows that her character has developed by the end of the series is when she doesn't take Bojack back as a client during her wedding. She's made it where she needs to be, and doesn't want to tempt herself with a set of problems she knows will be dangerous for her and her happiness. 
All right, y'all, that's it. All the characters of BoJack Horseman ranked from dumbest to most brilliant. Who do you think was the smartest character on the show? And who was just stupid? Let us know down in the comments, as well as what other topics or shows you'd like to see us cover. While you're down there, remember to hit that notification bell and binge our dumb to brilliant playlist, where we figure out which characters have the most wits. But most importantly, stay wicked.